So, uh, Christopher Leinberg, we're delighted to have you here in Sydney. Uh, you've been doing some fantastic work in American cities, uh, looking at the real estate implications of, uh, you know, what, what is popular in the market in, in a kind of new mo housing markets. Could you say a bit about that work mm -hmm. and then about your visit to Sydney? Well, as you know, the U.S. probably invented sprawl. It was a brand new concept in, uh, you know, 100 years ago. And we, uh, there was a great pent-up demand for it, and we in real estate provided what the market wanted, which was low-density, drivable suburban stuff. And we, like you here, had lots of land. So that's where the phrase dirt cheap came from. And we just kept on pushing it further and further out into the hinterlands. Well, we found over the last 15 years, doing market research and consumer research and just watching the trends, that that pendulum's begun to swing back towards demanding walkable urban again. And we see this in, in the various price premiums that we have for housing, for apartments, for retail, for office. And what used to be very cheap, walkable urban 20 years ago, is now the most expensive offering in the marketplace and we're finding that we've overbuilt drivable suburban and th uh, that the prices are now flat or, or in fact falling. Can you say a bit about uh, also um, the, the, your typology isn't just walkable urban and drivable suburban, you've got places in, in between and we, we feel as though we've got quite a lot of places kind of along the spectrum. What have you discovered? Well, those are the two ways to build the built environment, but there's a lot of variation within each. So with, with, with walkable urban, you can have densities such as downtown Sydney, which is extremely high density. But most of the walkable urban that we see being demanded is more of a small town sort of feel, much less dense, but it's still compact enough so that you can walk to get most of your daily needs met within yeah. walking distance. And walking distance is no more than a kilometer. And you're discovering that there's appetite for this even in the, what we might think of as the more suburban kind of... Uh, in in fact, what we've found in the U.S. is at least half of the pent-up demand for walkable urbanism is in the suburbs. It's the urbanization of the suburbs yeah. that's the big trend. We, we've been seeing our downtowns turn around for the last 15 years. But now the new frontier is, the, is in fact the urbanization of the suburbs. So, so Mark, um, Stockton's been showing some great intellectual and market leadership, I think, around sort of density done well and the quality of the, of the built environment. Does this discussion have echoes for you about uh, how you see uh, um, your activity? No, absolutely. And I mean, today, Tim, we just released the um, livability index. So we've been doing that since 2011. And you know, today we see in our communities um, with 2,500 respondents that their satisfaction is 83%. And what really resonates in that survey is, is three key points. You know, one is that you have these connected communities where people can form you know, deep relationships, make new friends, feel safe, get around uh, in a walkable manner. And, and that connection is, is the second most important element in designing uh, connected walkable communities and then thirdly is to bring that amenity early and make sure that that is there the schools the childcare the walking the running fields the uh, places for people to to be and that idea of shared space you know that yeah, that is yeah. really the shared economy the shared space and creating that deep sense of place is really what's resonating uh, across the resident base. What I think is great about all, all this is sometimes we have the discussions about you know urbanism and it all sounds a bit fancy but you're discovering and, and so Chris has a real market appetite for the kind of density done well discussion people want to mix the some of the uh, the uh, the residential appeal of some kind of suburban environment with a bit more of a walkable environment to walk to centres and all this kind of stuff so it's great that you are doing the work on, on what people like and then building some of those places. Now one of those places that we love in the Committee for Sydney, we took Chris to and your team yesterday, was Bargala uh, Shopping Centre, which is actually a very good mixed use place in Sydney and I think is a bit of a model. I, I, you're, you're proud of that I think. Yeah, no, we're very proud of that. Uh, you know, I've never had a bad thing said about Bargala and, and it really integrates those key elements. It's, it's smart uh, and it's connected and it's a place where people can easily walk around, get to the shops, the services, public transport's very central, and and the quality of what is there is good. In a relative sense, it was a very affordable project as well. 
And so bringing those elements together you know, has created a better way to live for the residents of Balgala and, and they love those, those elements. And uh, to Chris's point, we're now seeing that resonate you know, right across Australia in all our communities that would have traditionally not have had townhomes in them yeah. and not had uh, those town centres as early as what you're now seeing it. Just on a personal front, I moved into that area and part of the attraction was that we could walk to the Balgala Shopping Centre yeah. and it's a walkable centre for and us. Actually, that's a fascinating point because yeah. these concentrations of high density walkable urban places benefit the suburban neighbourhoods around it that they have the best of two worlds. Yeah. They can live in suburbia and walk to great urbanism. And what we've found is that the price premiums for those houses, anywhere from 40 to 100% on a price per square meter basis because they're in the best of two worlds. I think there's some research we're about to do with the community of Sydney actually is to find out what the property uplift has been for these kinds of places. But Lucy, this I know for a long period you've been thinking around this kind of stuff. This is music to your ears, I think. Yeah. And in terms of what you're doing with the Greater Sydney Commission, how does it fit in? Well, walkable urbanism is fascinating to me within the, within the, I guess, the envelope of what the Greater Sydney Commission is doing because we are charged with leading metropolitan planning for Sydney with a view to ensuring livability, productivity and sustainability. Yeah. And the wonderful thing about walkable urbanism is that actually it achieves all three. Um, it makes people more closely connected to places, to, to the shops, to the things they need to do. They don't have to get into the car to go everywhere, so temporally they're better connected. Um, it's much more livable if you don't have to drive around so much in traffic. And it's also much more sustainable because you reduce your uh, dependency on, on uh, fossil fuel. So it actually ticks all three boxes and people don't really appreciate how not only convenient it is, but how sustainable and productive it is. It is interesting though, the people might not talk about these things, but where they choose to live yeah. is the, where these places provide these kind of amenities. Absolutely. Seems to be. And you see, for me, you know, I've always ver been very interested in the history of cities. And what we are actually doing is we are going back to the future. If you, if you look here, like if you look, you know, four or five kilometres so, uh, uh, radius from here, you will see the sort of walkable urbanism that we lost with the, with the uh, ideal of the garden city, which yeah. turned into car dependent suburbanism. Uh, we are actually getting back to what people used to do for centuries before the car was invented. <laughs> You'll see uh, a clip from Back to the Future, which is the best popular movie about urbanism ever made. It's true. So it's interesting though, by the way, Lucy's a bit modest, she's actually written a book about uh, Sydney, a biography of Sydney, which is still available on Amazon, I point out. But, uh, but Mark, you look as though you wanted to say something. I, I, I'd like you also to say something, perhaps responding to this, but you're very passionate also, as is the company, around the affordability agenda looking forward. How, how do you see that in terms of uh, this discussion? Yeah, well, you know, certainly uh, the other element is using the land more intensively and of course that re relates in a lower cost element of land and as a result more affordable product and here in Sydney we had great examples where you know recent planning changes enabled townhomes in places like Marsden Park um, as an example in Schofields where you hadn't historically had that product and you go from a whole of market first home buyer participation rate of about 8% to 60% and that's because they're able to get into a two three bedroom uh, walk up townhome uh, with a small yard and that shared space and uh, on release that was uh, you know in the mid $500,000 range which represented great great value it's gone up a little bit since then but still represents a really good price point. Mm. You must be delighted to hear all this stuff you know in the world. Absolutely right, because, because I mean as you know well you've been working on this yeah. with the committee for Sydney which of course I used to be uh, closely connected with um, you know the idea of cities like Sydney, which are, you know, have, have a lot of spread to them, yeah. like 65 kilometres from the, from the coast to the edge, if we don't actually create a polycentric city, the place will become yeah. much less livable and much less productive and much less sustainable. So uh, very fundamental to the idea of supporting and building polycentricity is having lots of urban spaces, import significant urban spaces for jobs and housing, and also lots of vibrant local centres which depend on having yeah. an urban form. Yeah. So local urbanism and metropolitan urbanism and you know strategic centre urbanism 
is vitally, vitally important for a, a, a strong future for a large Australian city. Well, I think we all agree, and we've never had a better opportunity, I think, to bring everybody together around the same strategy. I mean, the Greater Sydney Commission itself is a breakthrough, I think, but we're, we're seeing some great collaboration between the public and private sector, mm. as well as public-public collaboration, actually, uh, than, than we've ever seen before. So we're a bit more optimistic that we can achieve this. Come to Chris for a, a sort of final observation. You're in Sydney. You're obviously an expert. You've been here two days now. <laughs> and uh, I, was gonna, I was not going to ask you your reflections, but I will ask you your <laughs> reflections. Um, are these profoundly different environments, or do they seem somewhat familiar to you? These are quite familiar. And this is, in essence, Southern California, where, where, where I used to live um, 20, 25 years ago. Uh, and the thing about Southern California is that they have reached the end of, the, of their ability to grow in a drivable suburban manner. As a result, they have now invested massively, $160 billion locally raised to put in place their rail transit system. Solar, yeah. And that they are now, back to the future, building walkable urban places and it's interesting because they're, they're building it based upon the former rail network that was in place 100 years ago. And so hopefully you will, you and Sydney will not have to experience what Los Angeles has had to go through these last 20, 30 years to get to that point. You can do it before you get to the, you know, the pollution filled, uh, you know, congested place that Los Angeles has become. Yeah. I was going to say, I, I think my final question actually for, for Mark, but a, a proposition first, which is that um, we learn from uh, international experience and it's great that uh, uh, Stockland's enabled this conversation to happen because Chris has got a very distinguished reputation and it's really interesting stuff for us. So it's great and thank you very much for assisting in that. Great, great cities collaborate to compete, so the public-private collaboration is critical, the international collaboration is critical. Um, but what is great, I think, about the moment is that we've got companies like Stockland actually delivering stuff with these principles. I mean, it's a, it's a good time to be doing this stuff. Do you feel optimistic about uh, building this city? Yeah, no, very. You know, I, I think the, the Greater Sydney plan that the Greater Sydney Commission under Lucy's stewardship is putting forward uh, has real solutions in it. You know, it, it defines an overarching set of principles around connectedness and bringing, enabling infrastructure and places for people to live, work and play uh, in, in a deterministic way. And if we can do that well, um, you can get tremendous benefits in the way that we're talking. And if you take an Australian statistic for a moment, in the next decade, diabetes will see an increase in healthcare costs of $89 billion, $89 billion. <laughs> And so the, the social and economic dividend of getting these things right is huge. And it really is not only the solution to a happier, healthier, better way to live, but it solves uh, also fiscal issues as it relates to funding, uh, these, these spiralling health costs. And so everything points in the right direction and you've now got this uh, position from an overarching uh, point of view. You now need to ensure that all the players come together and that ultimately it's not just the state government working with local government, but it's also the departments and it is the delivery of infrastructure and clearly the private sector has a role to play to be responsible and to um, adhere to these principles and to find those natural synergies to create the element of affordable and social housing, to, to densify sensibly, to incorporate the childcare and the play spaces and the playgrounds and the town centres and to graduate the density in a way in which it has that real human scale. So people, when they're engaging with it, feel that it is personable and, and you have that passive surveillance and you have those connections. There are bigger agendas about building the city in a healthy way that we're into. From a health point of view, the US uh, Surgeon uh, General has said that walkability, if it was a pill, yeah. would be the miracle pill of the century. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, from the climate change point of view, it's 60, 70, 80 percent of the way that we're going to address climate change yeah. is by building walkable urban places. They are so much more energy efficient. So on these not small points, I think we conclude our conversation and say thank you, Mark, thank you, Chris, and thank you, Lucy, for what I thought was a brilliant conversation, which I hope goes viral. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Cheers. Thank you.